must have 14, 15, 16 kids. Isn't that awesome having all these kids here? God is good. Give me that praise. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. It's a little low up here, but I must not be up there. Okay. In case any of you haven't been here the last couple weeks, we're in the middle of a six-week series that I've titled The Greats. We started a couple weeks ago with a message about the Great Commission. It is our commission from our Commander-in-Chief, Jesus Christ, to go out and knock down the gates of hell and set people free, set the captives free. We are to win the world for Christ. That is our, the Great Commission for each and every one of us. This, uh, last week, we talked about the Great Commandment. And the Great Commandment is to do what? Love God and love others. In fact, I told you guys last week, the best way we can carry out the Great Commission is by living out the Great Commandment. Literally loving people into the Kingdom of God. Today we're going to look at the Great Calling. And I alluded to it last week when I told you guys that we need to live above the fray. We need to live differently and love differently. And so today we're going to talk about this Great Calling that we have as sons and daughters of God. If I can get everyone to please stand this morning, and we will be looking at Colossians chapter 1. We'll be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I almost got that right. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11. It may not be number one, but you guys are, okay? Verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And where is Jesus seated? Right at the God. right hand of God. That's the most important position there is in heaven next to God, is the right hand of God, so remember that. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. In other words, you were once there when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so excited, Lord. So excited to be in your house today. We're so excited to be able to study your word, Lord. We thank you for everything that has taken place prior to this. But Lord, we know that was just set up for what you have for us right now, Lord. What we're going to take home with us today. And so, Father God, I just ask for your anointing this morning to fall upon me as I preach, Lord. To open minds, to open hearts, to open eyes, to open ears, Lord, that we might receive, Father God, what you have for us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard what happened last Sunday in Texas. And what makes that tragedy even worse is it could have been avoided. The Air Force had just done its job and put the shooter's name on a, on a certain database, then he wouldn't have been able to go out and uh, buy his weapons of mass carnage. It could have been stopped. Now this morning I want to tell you something. I want to reassure you that what happened in Texas will never happen here. Those poor people were caught off guard. We will not be. In fact, we have at least one person in this church who is trained to deal with people like that. And we have several, and amen, and we have several others who are willing to fight for you. But the truth of the matter is, 
you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than ever experiencing what happened in Texas. But if some, by some remote chance that it would ever happen, I want you to know that we are ready. And so what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say you're safe. Now, I will not even dignify that evil man by mentioning his name. I hate it when the news does that. It just gets copycat syndrome going on. So I won't dignify him by even mentioning his name. All I'll say is that he was kicked out of the Air Force for beating his wife and fracturing the skull of his son. You know, in other jobs in society, he may not have lost his job. In the, in the private sector, he might not have lost his job. But in the military, you're held to a higher standard. And so because of what he did, the, the military court-martialed this man and gave him a dishonorable discharge. You realize that officers are held to an even higher standard than enlisted men are? What might be a simple reprimand or a simple slap on the hand for an enlisted man could be a, a career ender for an officer. They're called to live different. They're called to live above the fray. And in the same way, we are held as Christians to a higher a standard than what the rest of the people are. That's our great calling. Now we have uh, George Dominey who's in our congregation today. I would say George was once a Marine, but that's not true. See, once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. Amen? There you go. I like it. I told him I was going to try that, but I figured I might mess it up, so thank you for saving me there, George. You know, there is a phrase in Latin that every Marine is taught in boot camp. Every Marine is taught this phrase, and this phrase is the embodiment of what it means to be a Marine. And that phrase is Semper Fidelis. Sometimes you hear it called Semper Fi. Semper Fidelis means always faithful. Semper Fidelis became the Marine Corps model in 18, motto in 1883. And so it's been its motto for 134 years. And so Marines are taught to always be faithful to their mission, to, to each other, to their country, and to the Corps, no matter what. And that's exactly what they do. And so, George, I just want to say thank you for your service. That's exactly what they do. Now, most of you guys know that I was in the Navy. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly, I wish the Navy had a model like that. But buddy knows, buddy knows what I'm talking about. He was in the Navy, too. No, our motto is, uh, you're supposed to have a girlfriend in every port. Oh. That's, that's the only thing I remember the Navy teaching me, is we're supposed to have a girlfriend in every port. And then I got married, and Kelly... Then you didn't. Then I got married. And Kelly said, no girlfriends in any ports. <laughs> now, obviously, one of those sayings is a little more noble than the other one is. Amen? Amen? You know, as Christians, God has called us to be faithful as well. It doesn't matter how other people are living around us. As Christians, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to live differently. Now, that's our great calling. But before I move on, I, I really need to say this in case I got some of you nervous this morning. I started talking about court martials and being kicked out of service, and I'm kind of trying to tie that in and explain our higher calling. Uh, what I want to say is that God will never court martial you just because you blow it. God will never discharge you or kick you out of his family because you messed up. You know, even though we have a higher calling, there's a higher expectation on us as Christians we still have a secure future. We still have a secure eternity. And I'm going to talk about that in about three weeks when I talk about the great closure. And it's the sense that we have closure when we die. We know where we're going. Right. I'm thankful when I went to Tom's service yesterday that the family had closure because they knew where he was at. And so I'm not going to say any more about that. We're going to talk about that in three weeks. In verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ... Keep seeking the things above. And there are a couple of things I want to pull out of that verse. The first thing I want to pull out of that verse is when he says, when Paul says, we have been raised up with Christ, he's talking about the image of baptism. He's talking about when we go into baptism, there is this imagery that God has given us that when our faith becomes real and we get baptized, that there's this imagery that God wants us to have of us going down in that water 
and dying to self, dying with Jesus to self. And when we come out of that water, the imagery that God wants us to see and wants us to always remember is as we come out of that water, not because of the water, but because of our faith, but when we come out of that water, we are a new creation in Christ. That's why we have baptism. To give us this beautiful image of what God is doing on the inside. How he's changing us. How we are dying to the old life. And we're being raised to walk in newness in life. To walk and to live like Jesus lived. Amen? Does that make sense? Now the second thing I want to point out from that verse is that it says, Seek the things above. Seek the things above. According to Paul in the next few verses, seeking the things above means rejecting the things below. The things that Jesus, uh, Paul's telling us to reject below are the things on this earth that make us and others miserable. I mean, listen to the list of things he describes in, in starting in verse 5. He says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Which means you don't want any part of this. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, Impurity, passion, that's an evil passion, by the way. We can be passionate about good things. Evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And then he goes on in verse 8 and says, But now you also put them all aside. <clears throat> Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Now let me ask a question. If you had the ability, if you had the ability to create a, a perfect human being, how many of those <clears throat> characteristics would you put into that person? I'm guessing not one. Because those are not strengths, those are weaknesses. So unless you're trying to recreate Frankenstein, I mean, you're going to leave those things out, right? And that's what God is calling us to do, to leave these things out, to leave them behind. Notice he says, we put them all aside. That's leaving them behind. You know, when I got married to Kelly, I knew I was going to have to leave some things behind. I knew there were certain behaviors that I had as a, a bachelor that would be completely unacceptable as a married man. For example, behaviors like leaving the toilet seat up. <laughs> behaviors like not washing the dishes for a week. Behaviors like not taking a bath for three days. And probably the worst one of all, living off of beer and TV dinners. I, I knew that, that something was going to have to change. And you know, once we accept Christ, what I want you to know is that there are some things in our lives that need to go bye-bye as well. It's not that it's okay when others do that, because it's not. It's just that we are held to our higher calling. Now I want to say this, because sometimes I think people misunderstand when we're trying to live a godly life, when we're trying to, to live a holy life. When I talk about a higher calling or, you know, or a godly calling, I'm not talking about sticking your nose up in the air. That's not what our higher, higher calling is, isn't to stick our nose higher. Uh, because we need to realize that we're not any better than anyone else. We're all sinners in need of grace, amen? amen? And so we don't do it to be better. We do it because we have a higher calling that God has given us. And let me tell you something. We do this for two reasons. First and foremost, because we are sons and daughters of God. We carry the family name of God. And just as your actions are a direct reflection on your biological family name, your actions as a Christian are a direct reflection on your spiritual family name. Amen? You know, when non-believers hear names like Jimmy Swaggered, and Jim Baker, what do you think that they uh, think of Christianity as a whole? I can tell you, it's not good. I mean, it may not be fair, but it's not good. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to run around and hide our sin. Because that's the worst thing we can possibly do. See, people aren't stupid. Your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, guess what? They know you're a sinner. It's not a secret. So don't try to make it a secret. Be real. But always, listen to me carefully, always be working to live a better life. Now the second reason we need to live out this great call that we have, and, and we need to live above the fray, is because we need to live a life 
that when non-Christians, non-believers look at our lives, they need to be able to say, you know what? They have something that I don't have. They have something that I don't have and I want it. Let's presume that I'm an alcoholic. And I'm at the bar and I'm sitting on the bar stool and the guy sitting next to me in his bar stool is an alcoholic just like me. You know, I'm not going to be going to him looking for help if I want to quit drinking. I mean, he's got the same problem I have. I'm not saying every person in the bar is an alcoholic. I'm just saying in this situation, if he's an alcoholic, I'm not looking for help, for, for help from this guy. In the same way, if I'm struggling with weight, and I know somebody else who's struggling with weight, and they're not having any more success than I am. I mean, it's not to put them down. But if they're not having any more success than I am, guess what? I'm not going to use their method. It's not working. I'm going to find somebody that it's actually working with. See, people's lives are more messed up today than they've ever been. Our world is more messed up than it's ever been. People need hope. They need help. And the question is, where will they find it? Where will they find it? Now listen to me very, very carefully. We are supposed to be their help. We are supposed to be their hope. But if we don't look any different, if we don't live any different, if we don't love any different, then why should they listen to us? Now, this isn't to be judgmental. Um, I'm going to say it plainly. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I'm saved by grace. But I was at the store, and I wasn't really judging this guy, but I was at the store at Thriftway, I think it was on Thursday night, and there was this guy in front of me. And he was buying a 12-pack of beer, a pack of cigarettes, and a can of chew. And I remember as I looked at that combination, I said, this guy's got a death wish. <laughs> I mean, this guy's looking for an early grave. And you know what? For all I know, he might have been a Christian. For all I know, he might have been a Christian. He seemed like a nice guy, so I'm not judging him. All I'm saying is, you know what? If I have a problem with alcohol, if I have a problem with tobacco, that's not the guy I'm going to ask help from. And so that's one of the reasons. It's not like we're better than people because we have a higher calling. It's just we need to understand. We carry God's family name. And we need to understand that we need to have something better to offer people. Something better to offer. So that's why we have this high calling. I think what Paul is telling us in this text this morning is it's all about a mindset. Paul is saying, set your mind on the things above. You ever heard anybody say, uh, you need to get your head out of the gutter? Hopefully not to you, but maybe to somebody else. Usually that happens because somebody says something that's innocent, and then somebody takes it and twists it, and pretty soon it's something that's not so innocent. I think there are times that God looks at our lives and says, you know what? Get your minds and your lives out of the gutter. Get your minds and your lives out of the gutter. Get them off this earth and refocus on heaven, on the things above. That's our great calling, to have our minds and our lives focused on heaven. Heaven is the model. Let me tell you something, the greatest example of seeking the things above, the greatest example in the history of the world, was Jesus Christ. He modeled for us how to live and how to love. In fact, he even tells us in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, what it looks like when you're seeking things from above. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Because <laughs> Jesus did it on a mountain. It says, And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit earth. Blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amazing. They shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. It's not good, it's great. And then Jesus ties it all together in verse 16 when he says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now Paul also shows us a little bit of how to seek the things above. He showed us earlier, I mentioned all those negative characteristics we wouldn't want to have. But he also mentioned some positive characteristics of what it looks like to seek things from above, to seek heaven the way they live. In verse 12 it says, So as those who have been chosen of God, isn't it nice to know that we've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Which is the perfect bond of unity. And so that's what it means to be seeking the things above, to be living like heaven lives. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He came down to earth and showed us what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. And it's our calling to do it to the best of our ability, to try to live like they live in heaven. Amen? Amen. Now, George is going to think this is the greatest sermon I've ever preached. You know, another Marine Corps model is, many are called, few are chosen. Amen. You realize that's actually a quote from the Bible? About the great banquet before Jesus comes back, many are called, but few are chosen. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian this morning, you've not only been called, but you've been chosen. Amen. That means that you pass the muster, which means you're going to heaven. Amen? Amen. But when I think about that phrase, many are called, but few are chosen, I can't help but think about our great calling that we have. We all have that same calling to live like heaven lives. But if we're honest, we don't always do that, do we? There are times in our lives, there are seasons in our lives when we get so caught up with the things of this earth that we don't even think about heaven. And the point I want to make off of that is if you look through the history of the world, you look through the Bible, you'll notice that it's always the few that God uses. You look at the Samuels and the Davids and the people like that. And even though David had a terrible sin, if you look at his life as a whole, he was a man who was truly trying to live out and live a higher calling. And I really believe that if we're going to do great things with our lives, and I believe every one of you are capable of doing that, and I want you to do that. But if you want to be one of the few, you've got to take serious this great calling that we have. And so my prayer this morning for all of us is that we would take our eyes off of this earth and refocus them on Him.